Thank you, Peter. As Peter said, I'm going to talk about giving maps a second life with digital technologies. This image that you're seeing on the screen here uh, was made by Edward Quinn, a map maker, in 1830. He made this map of the Garden of Eden. They, they still believed in the creation in those days. In the time of the deluge, with the rest of the earth then unknown, and this thus covered in the dark clouds of ignorance. In the next dozen or so maps in his historical atlas that follow this one, he shows the expansion of geographical knowledge over 4,000 years, up to the late 1800, up to 1830, by the recession of the clouds of ignorance at key time periods in history. I think Quinn's series of maps is a paradigm for the growth of geographic knowledge in our own time. Yet our geographic ignorance in the recent past has been caused not by lack of geographic knowledge. We certainly have an enormous amount of that. Rather, it's been caused by the lack of good means to disseminate widely that knowledge. Today, in the short period of just a decade, we are seeing how digital technologies, most prominently GIS, geographic information systems, but increasingly now virtual reality, databases, search engines, online mapping services, all offer the possibility of disseminating geographic knowledge on a scale not imagined by Quinn. As search engines themselves increasingly use maps to filter and display information, I don't think it's overstating things to say that maps are becoming a large part of web users' experiences, certainly beyond the proportion of use that maps receive in the static print world. In fact, it was clear before the web that maps were going in the opposite direction less use by people, less geographic literacy, a shrinking share of the knowledge base, really Quinn's cloud maps moving in reverse. But fortunately, mapping, I think, is now poised to become both a library system, and I'll show some examples of that in the talk, the spatial organization of knowledge, and a series of public tools to create that system of knowledge. It's the perfect mix, really, for the user-driven web world. Going forward, this will create not just increased geographic literacy, but will increase people's ability to even think spatially, to see cause and effect in the environment in spatial terms, which we know is so important today. Looking backwards, it's already had a big impact on historical analysis, as GIS and historical studies have been joined, uniting history and geography in the academy once again after a long period of separation and reminding us that everything happens somewhere, not just sometime. These technologies have given all maps a second life, and for me, this digital revolution has enabled the recreation, as Peter said, of my old analog paper historical map library into an ever-evolving online resource for people interested in the evolution of this fascinating juncture of science, art, and history that historical maps embody all available at my online map library portal for the last 10 years, davidrumsey.com. I remembered that seven years ago I gave a talk at a DLF forum in Pittsburgh that showed the very first uses I was making of GIS as applied to historical maps. Today I'll show how that process has evolved in the ensuing years and other tools that I've added, especially my recent forays into virtual worlds like Second Life and Google Earth. As libraries today increasingly realize that their analog special collections are the unique knowledge resources that they must digitize and turn into online libraries, I hope that my trajectory of transforming my physical map library into a library of content and tools may have some relevance. This journey started about 10 years ago in my map library in San Francisco, shown here when I realized that I could give no new life to my old maps by making them available to people over the internet. My motivation, above all, was to give the maps away digitally again and again, and to share with people all the aspects of old maps that make them so interesting and compelling, all the reasons that I collected them. Instead of just giving the collection to an institutional library where it would be preserved, but access would be limited, Using these new technologies, I saw that I could give the collection digitally to a huge number of people in all parts of the world. I was determined to set a new model of a kind of digital philanthropy, the gift of a private collection through giving the images, the metadata, and the software tools. 
To accomplish this, I've developed various tools and platforms over the past decade. I've been able to share the collection with over 20 million people worldwide. The trajectory that I've followed begins with making the first digital images in the late 1990s through development of a digital image library, then using GIS to unlock information in the historical maps, then putting the maps in Google Earth, and very recently opening a map library in Second Life. I'll show many examples of the unlocking of the rich information that exists in historical maps that can occur with digital technologies through juxtaposition of images, image overlays, radical image reformatting, image mashups, and image compositing, just to name a few. As these views of my map library show, I collected a lot of historical maps. I was your typical out-of-control collector. Over 150,000 at last count in a period of about 25 years. These paper maps, charts, globes, and atlases are all the sources for the digital images in my online library. And they are visual history as well, and they tell us much about the times in which they were made. My collection covers roughly the period from 1700 to 1925. It includes maps of the entire world with a special focus on images of North America. This map of North America here by Guillaume de Lille, 1700, sort of bookends the early part of my collecting interest. And these three maps by John Bartholomew and the first edition of the London Times Atlas, also of North America, 1922, show the other end of my collecting interest. One of the themes that I explored with historical maps is the evolution of mapping technology itself over time and how it relates to our modern day GIS. Because obviously all mapping now, all modern cartography is GIS. So I began by learning the science of GIS. I actually began to see GIS principles in past mapping systems. I wrote about this in a book I wrote with Edie Punt called Cartographic Extraordinaire. These are a couple of the illustrations from that book. These same digital technologies transform me as a collector by allowing me to reverse the process of acquiring maps into a process of sharing and distributing them by building a new digital collection and eventually allowing me, which I'll show some of, even to collect digital copies of maps when I did not own the original paper map. My first use of technology with regard to the collection was creating a database to catalog all the maps. I'm sure I was a librarian in another life. Like many of you, I enjoyed filling in the blanks. I did this all the time I was collecting. This laid the groundwork for creating a virtual library, though at that stage it did not include images of the maps, only detailed descriptions. Then I began to make digital images of the maps by scanning them at high resolution. I began to see things in these scanned maps that I could not see as easily in the original. I'll show you an example here. This is Lewis and Clark's famous 1814 map published in Philadelphia of their trek up the Missouri River and onto the Pacific Ocean. Looking at the Lewis and Clark map, I was studying the way they had mapped the Missouri River, and particularly this grand detour, which is a very prominent feature of the river, a huge bend. At the same time, I acquired John Mellish's map of the United States, the first map to show the country coast to coast, published just two years later, also in Philadelphia, and I realized Mellish had lifted everything from the Lewis and Clark map. Looking at the images digitally, I was able to compare the Mellish and see how he called it now the Great Bend, and putting the Lewis and Clark next to it, again in digital form, because these maps are vastly different size. The Lewis and Clark is about this big, the Mellish is about six feet across. I realized this was a wonderful way to begin to study the maps and to learn more about them. So after I had compiled, I don't know, several hundred of these digital images, fortunately for me, the internet evolved in the mid-90s. And I realized I could take these digital images and use them not just for my own research, but also to share the collection. So I launched the online library in 99 with 2,000 images. As I said, the site is free to all users. This changed everything about my work. Suddenly, I had thousands of people a day using my online maps, and I was the proprietor, like many of you, of a virtual library. 
davidrumsey.com is the hub for my content building. Today we have over 17,000 maps online. And for my experiments with software to view and understand that content. It's highly unlikely that you would ever see these maps in their paper forms. They're too far away, too rare, they're too fragile. But with high resolution images delivered on the internet from my online library, you can explore them at will and get to know them intimately. This is the simplest way that maps are given a second life and transformed from private assets to public good by providing access to the information they hold. But in their digital reincarnation, these maps have even more potential. Their information through the images can be unlocked through the use of various software tools and applications and policies resulting in an amplification of the inherent meaning and allowing it to be used across many disciplines. We can see many aspects of the transformation and reuse of historical maps by looking at the journey in my own online collection of this map image of 12 lobe gores by Giovanni Cassini. It was made in Rome, printed in Rome in 1790 for a 13 inch globe. And we can see how this has been transformed by digital technology. The image was put online by the Library of Congress Geography and Map Division many years ago. I downloaded the images uh, from the Library of Congress site. Library of Congress, to its great credit, was one of the earliest sites to actually allow free downloading, not just free viewing, but complete downloading of all of their map images and everything else in American memory. They were an inspiration for me to follow the same path. And I experimented with these scores, with georeferencing them here in ArcMap, scores if you know about map projections, you'll know that the UTM projection is the classic global projection. And I was able to reproject them digitally in UTM, then combine six of them together in one group and six in another group. And then to re-project uh, them in a geographic or unprojected form. Then using ESRI's ArcGlobe software, I was able to wrap the gores into a virtual globe that you see here. So I've been able to take this 13-inch paper globe that Mr. Cassini would have made in 1790, and now we have a complete digital representation of it. Now that I'm in GIS, I can combine it here with NASA's image of the world at night, which is the modern Earth, and get a real sort of visual and somewhat metaphoric sense of how the Earth has changed over time. So this was very exciting to me, but I was still limited to the desktop, and I wanted a way to distribute this the way I did my historical maps. So fortunately for me, along came Keyhole, the precursor of Google Earth. I was able to create a KML of the globe and share it with Keyhole users. It was still not public. Google Earth then bought Keyhole in 2005, and working with John Hankey and the Google Earth team, I was able to create 16 images of maps in Google Earth and share it with their 250 million Google Earth users worldwide. Finally, but not the end of this chain, I hope, I placed the globe in Second Life, where I was able to um, make it 100 meters tall. If you know Second Life, everything is gauged in scale by the size of your avatar, and your avatar is roughly two meters. Here we see it in Second Life on my new map island, my map museum. This is my avatar, my new avatar, more spiffy than the one that's in your brochure. Um, flying across Yosemite Valley map from 1883 towards the globe. This is a whole other way now to experience this Cassini globe. My avatar can look at it from the outside and fly into the middle where we have reversed the globe and put it on the inside. And of course, this being Second Life, where you build everything, we built an orrery and a little place to sit. Um, but these are all done in, 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 in multiple prims, it's called, of high resolution. So you know, my avatar can stick his nose next to that map and really see pretty much everything you might see uh, from the original image. All this prompted me, since I didn't own this map, this was sort of something that was a bit odd for me to do. I, I usually went the other way. You know, I owned the paper, I made it digital. But I found the map in London through a dealer friend of mine. 
And I bought the globe gores for the terrestrial map and for the celestial. And then I did the same thing with the celestial map. I put the celestial map in Google Earth, and here we see it, 64 million meters outside the Earth, rotating around the Google terrestrial globe. This was before Google Sky launched. I did this last fall. Google Sky launched in the fall. They came to me. They knew of this work. And I gave them this image. And now it's a uh, historical map layer in Google Sky that you can find. And it's really marvelous. It, they, they trans, let's see, they, if you know astronomy, they took it back to 1790, where the stars would have been, and did their georeferencing that way. And it matched up beautifully. So here it is with the modern constellations overlaid. The only thing that's a little strange about it is it's backwards because this is a God's eye view of the universe. That's how they made the celestial globe. And it's in Italian, which is interesting. Um, and then, of course, uh, put them in to put the celestial globe next, next to the terrestrial in second line. So this journey of the life and changing use of a map image and its multiple effects shows us how things have evolved in the last 10 years. Maps have become digital, including the old analog maps. They're widely shared, reused, reformatted, and experienced in new ways hardly imagined by their creators. It also reminds us that rich tool sets can reveal more aspects of data sets and data than we might imagine. I'd like to speak now about the evolution of the software tools that I've used in building these online map libraries, which enable users to work with maps in various ways and to pull more information about the maps than, it's available, than it is available by simply looking at them individually. This started with better display and searching software, such as the Luna imaging software that I use, shown here. Allowing, this allows the comparison of multiple maps, the creation of presentations, mashups, saving groups of maps, printing maps, and better searching. We can see here this uh, classic Luna format, the thumbnail view, bringing maps into the image workspace, being able to move them around, look at them in relative size, annotate them, link them to other web pages, zoom in, and make presentations with them as well. This was all built in a Java client. Um, the new version of the Luna software that I'll be putting up on my map site in May takes all of the, almost all of the features of, those, of the Java client and puts it in a browser form, because the browser has evolved so much in the last year that we can do these dynamic things now in the browser. It also adds this uh, faceted browsing, who, what, where, when, and category browsing, all derived from the metadata, which many of you are familiar with. It's, it's a wonderful way to reveal metadata structure. It, it is also highly uh, linkable. Everything now in this application can be spidered, not just the individual maps themselves, but all of the facets and all of the combinations uh, that the application itself makes. In addition, you see here the image workspace now in the browser is fully dynamic. Uh, these are maps of Minneapolis, which I just thought would be fun to look at. You can resize the windows, uh, and you can create a URL for the dynamic workspace, send it to somebody else, they open it in a whole new browser window, and it opens the same maps, and they're all live. So they can take that mashup, change it, uh, and send it on to somebody else. So this offers lots of interesting possibilities, uh, I think, for people to work with the maps and to actually share those results, use them in courseware uh, in any way that they, that they might like. Here's another example of the workspace. You can also embed it in a blog that has a full embedding feature. And this is the taking the facets now into a category kind of browse where everything is ranked by uh, alphabet instead of by numbers. At the same time that I was expanding the collection in size, I was realizing that serendipity had sort of gone out of the collection. When you get over 10,000 images, it's hard for people to just discover things. So we built a whimsical tool based on a stock ticker. It's called the map ticker. And the entire collection goes by in random order in about eight hours. You can do your email. 
you really have to love maps to utilize this tool, but, but we're still good digital librarians, so if you find something that interests you, you mouse over it, you get the brief metadata down below, and say you want to look at the Alaska map, you click on it, and it goes into the Luna database, opens the map up, you can do all the typical things you'd want to do, zoom in, zoom out, save it, look at the metadata. And so on. Early on, we began to add GIS functions to the online library. Uh, the EKI group I worked with oh, eight years ago, they helped me to start this. This required georeferencing the maps. So just, uh, many of you know what that is, but just in case, uh, here's the Lewis and Clark map I showed earlier. We georeference it twist it, turn it, bring it into modern coordinates, then we're able to overlay uh, modern or any uh, information layers on top of it, in this case, a map of the United States showing state boundaries, roads, and major cities. Or we can bring in data layers. Uh, these are all of Lewis and Clark's campsites. The yellow dots can be clicked on, and you can find uh, latitude and longitude of where they camped and notes on what they did. We then are able to take that georeferenced map and open it in a, in a virtual globe, like ESRI's Arc Globe, do transparency against the modern satellite view, tilt it, see it in a global context, how it wraps the area, and also, again, combine it with other layers like the NASA layer, the world at night, and see how the area they traversed has settled up so amazingly in the ensuing years. We were determined to bring the GIS into the public sphere, so we first uh, worked with ArcIMS software, where uh, we modified it with a image viewer and a quad viewer, and we created various sets of uh, urban historical maps. This one of San Francisco. Four maps we'll look at in that uh, milieu. San Francisco, 1890, 1869, 1859 and 1915. These are all georeferenced. All these maps are drastically different sizes, but in the quad viewer, they're all the same size and scale, and they move together as we zoom into the area around South Beach, and we can see change quite clearly uh, over time. You can change any of the windows into uh, any other layers that you want. At the same time, we've built a very simple transparency image viewer. Here is this map, 1869, of the North Beach, north coast of San Francisco. We can blend in the modern satellite view and see how the coves have filled in over time, or swipe the same view. The application also offers very uh, robust GIS tools, actually more robust than in Google Earth, although I, I'll show you Google Earth is moving in that direction. We then, but this limited us, we did about 200 maps in, in this series of work. We then collaborated with EKI and did 10,000 maps in a rough georeferencing of just the four corners. There's other maps that I showed you and the ones that I'll show you in Google Earth that we do like 50 or 60 points to really get the maps well aligned. In EKI, uh, you can search for the maps. It's in their metadata clearinghouse. These are maps of South America. The rough georeferencing, but still, a very valuable tool. Our next exploration was the creation of a 3D GIS, working with this map of Yosemite Valley, which I showed you earlier in Second Life from 1883. In that time, it was a marvelous map, the first accurate mapping of Yosemite Valley. They showed the steep cliffs with uh, a cartographic convention called Heshuri. We georeferenced the map shown here, combined it with a modern digital elevation model from the USGS, this little animation shows how we stretch the map to give a sense of depth. Then, using early gaming software and something called Virtual, we were able to create a, a public viewable site with a simple plugin. This is a little flash preview of it. And here is um, a view of it in the plugin. We can see the map now in three dimensions. I, did, I actually showed this work at DLF seven years ago, this particular 3D view. 
can turn it, twist it, and uh, it has underlying it a modern USGS map. And then just uh, next month, actually, this will be coming in Google Earth. This now gives us everything that we had in that viewer, but now we can see the map in the Sierra Nevada mountain in full 3D in a, in a much larger sense of context. That's what Google Earth offers. It shows where everything fits. We can do transparency. We can zoom into the map, fly through it. And as I'll show, Google Earth offers basically unlimited ability to work with maps of different scales and projections. And then finally, here in Second Life, we took a major portion of that whole Yosemite map and laid it out over four sims, 512 meters by 512 meters. So the scale feels gigantic now. It's, it's not your one-to-one -one map, but it's, it's getting closer. So it's a whole other kind of feel for the map that happens in Second Life. We take advantage of the draw distance of 512 uh, meters so that you can see the whole map uh, laid out. Google Earth is the ultimate context machine for my historical maps and that it can place them in time and scale right on the Earth as these examples show. So in late 2006, I, as I mentioned earlier, I created a public historical map layer in Google Earth, which is now in the gallery layer, Rumsey Historical Maps, with 16 historical maps. And we'll be adding another 100. Uh, they're actually online now, but they're tweaking them in uh, early May. This allows for all the tools of Google Earth and its growing layer of content to be seen with the historical maps and explored in various ways. So here's our 1853 map of San Francisco in Google Earth with the built city shown in black polygons. That was the way they did it in those days. You can turn on the Google Earth three-dimensional layer of the built city today and compare the two. Here's a map of Africa, maybe of interest to Joel, from 17. 87, a map of Tokyo from 1680, three maps of islands in the Caribbean from 1775, Seattle, 1890, maps of Europe from the 18th century, a map of Lima, Peru from the 1860s, a map of, of Kyoto in the foreground and Osaka in the background, both uh, from the 18th century a map of Tokyo, finally, from the 19th century. These, uh, this library will be accessed through these symbols in Google Earth. You will click on any of these symbols, and it will open up the maps uh, and display them. Google Earth hosts all kinds of information layers from worldwide sources. Here we see our 1836 map of New York City. We can turn in Google Earth, we can turn on their street map layer, their 3D building layer, their Wikipedia layer, even Google Book searches now in Google Earth. Google community creates endless amounts of interesting information. This is all user created. Tourist information, even YouTube. Not particularly relevant to historical maps, but sometimes interesting and panoramio layers, census information, and then, of course, other historical maps can be blended in. You can even do, as I said, beginning simple GIS in Google Earth. Here we measure the perimeter of New York City in 1836 of the island. It was 17.71, uh, sorry, 26.64 miles and 17.71 square miles. Compare that to the city today, and you can see again, typically with these urban areas, how the coastline fills in. To give a sense of the rapid growth, just since I started working with them a year and a half ago, these are just some of the layers that are in the gallery layer and the global awareness layer. They must be approaching at least 50 layers uh, in their own server 
They are also, if you look at their KML gallery, there are now hundreds of externally hosted layers. So this Google Earth is really becoming a major geospatial library of information, and not just uh, geospatial information. There's a Jane Austen layer that just launched in the KML gallery. <laughs> There's lots of humanities information that has geospatial aspects. Um, I'm working with the Smithsonian American Art Museum uh, helping them put 40,000 outdoor sculptures in North America in Google Earth with points on where they all are, linking to pictures, and so on. Google Earth even has the daily clouds now. This is clouds from November 2007, sort of whimsically laid over Henry Popple's map from 1733. Google Earth is moving into the virtual world. It's 3D representations uh, are getting more and more accurate, and using SketchUp, they're allows, allowing user-driven material, such as this wonderful Golden Gate Bridge on my 1915 map of San Francisco, or going across the ocean to Beijing, looking at this 1830 map of Beijing. Someone has built a marvelous representation of Tiananmen Gate. Google Maps itself, as many of you know, has a very open API that has allowed data providers to use it as a kind of instant GIS. There's literally thousands now of uses of uh, Google Maps for all kinds of things. And I'm collaborating with a group, which I'll speak a little more about later, called GeoGarage, to put all of my 120 historical maps that are in Google Earth into Google Maps. It's not a trivial thing, because working with these giant geotips and regenerating them in Google Maps is something that's difficult. In fact, Google hasn't even done it. But GeoGarage in France has, has figured out a way to do it. Map collecting itself is going through huge changes, I think. Um, I'm seeing the rise of digital map collectors. And I just want to mention the work of a friend, Matt Fox. Matt is, uh, works for the Environmental Protection Agency in Sacramento, and he's passionate about uh, making this Google Earth library of historical topographic maps. He downloads them from free sites, including my own, all over uh, the United States. And then he, his library creation is to build a KML index and visual display of how to find all the maps. He hosts this himself, and uh, it's been very popular uh, uh, with uh, historical map users. So I think this kind of thing is going to, to increase. Digital collecting of images and text, I think, will grow in the future as tools are developed to make it easier for people to do this. Here's his map of Pyramid Lake, near a place where I spend a lot of time in Nevada from 1894. We can look at the shoreline then and compare it with the Google Earth satellite image. The lake has shrunk. If any of you know Pyramid Lake, you know it's one of the big ecological issues of the area. The internet and the rise of broadband connections to it have had a major effect on the sharing of map data and increased access to mapping databases. Early on, we realized that if our goal with my map library online was to provide real access to the content and tools, we needed to get all of our content visible to internet search engines and other web indices, not just our site's homepage. So we opened the collection up to the search spiders and in various ways uh, today of the roughly 7,000 people a day who come to the site, 5,000 come to us via search databases where they find individual maps or groups of maps, not the homepage. For example, looking at our basic record of the Chevalier map shown here, of San Francisco, 1911-1915. This map appears in OCLC's WorldCat. We're a WorldCat terminal through the University of California, Berkeley. We've put now about 13,000 records. We've done original mark cataloging of maps that have never been cataloged before, and all of them linked to the electronic record. From OCLC, the records get downloaded into various uh, OPACs, Stanford, and UC Berkeley, of course, and Harvard. And then, of course, the maps show, show up in Google, Google Images, in Yahoo. We contributed to the Geography Network. These are just a few of the places that we do these things. Geography Network shows it in ArcGIS Explorer. And, of course, I mentioned we also put all of the maps into the ECHI 
clearinghouse database. The maps even show up in Flickr. People have built many collections out of my maps within Flickr uh, over the last year. And there's 43,228 external links to all of our content uh, that have been built up over the years, other websites, blogs, and more. A quick look at Google Analytics shows you our typical traffic pattern. This is October 30th of last year. We had 6,650 visits. The period of May 25 to November 28th of last year, 800,000 visits. They came from 216 countries, most, of course, from the United States, over half a million, but also from Brazil, under 5,000, Australia, about 11,000, even the Congo, 25, 25 visits. Sorry, uh, they came from 16,621 cities, including China, which sent about 2,000 visitors from 119 cities. The more that maps and other kinds of information databases are open to search engines, the more that can be made use of them. But I also think that one needs to open them up to other kinds of content as well. So I've done this over the past few years through Visual Collections, the site where you can combine cartography, fine arts, architecture, photography, and other images. These are all in the Luna application. Allows you to compare Japanese maps to my Western maps of Japan, to look at Japanese maps with art images from another database, and to look at text images here of the cursor letters from Chile with a map of Chile from my collection, and then art images from another collection. For our work, this is an example of a policy of openness that is realized through various kinds of site design considerations, software functions, and collaborative relationships. This is really how our library participates in the growing cyber infrastructure network for the humanities. My maps are viewed and downloaded by a wide variety of users, from scholars to homeschoolers to genealogists, historians, publishers, engineers, collectors, archaeologists, Wikipedians, and more and more they're used in applications and sites that are often far removed from their original home. I think that librarians and libraries should focus on making their collections available to the widest community and let the community build tools and other uses of the content on top of that data. GeoGarage, as I mentioned earlier, is an example of my data being used in this way. Unknown to me, they harvested my, this huge 24 gigabyte image of France, which is free from my website. They built their own platform around it. They put it up as a demo. I got notice of it from a Google alert, found what they were doing, and now I'm collaborating with them. So making content available to be harvested by imaginative people is, is really critical, I think, for moving the agenda ahead. There's a growing community of software builders, both open source and large commercial platforms, like Google and other search engines, including asset actions that have been done here at DLF and many OAI-related projects. I think building software tools certainly can make sense for many libraries, but one, generally speaking, it's important not to forget that the time spent on doing the core work of digital conversion and metadata creation and creating tools that allow that content to be harvested and incorporated into multiple databases, this is important always trying not to lock the data up into closed silos of information. In this new space, then, a map is really not just a map. It's a digital, in its digital form, it can carry so many identities. First, I'll, I'll show two examples of this. Looking at Henry Popple's map here from 1733, we can look at it in a QuickTime VR of my library pan around the quick time and we see the actual atlas lying on the floor of the library. We can click on that in quick time and it opens in the Luna database. We can then see its representation in Luna, which is very fact factual, uh, faithful to the original. See the 20 sheets of the atlas. See the composite I made of all 20 sheets joined digitally. And zoom in and then do a mashup with the view that's in the upper left corner, other maps of New York City from different time periods, 
charts, area maps, modern charts, and views. And then you can move into a global context, seeing that same digital image now in Art Globe. We have a whole other perception of it. We can use transparency to see how it relates to the modern satellite view. And as we zoom into the cartouche here, we're now more in a virtual world where we're flying over the map. We're not limited to panning and zooming. We move across Central America and Florida up the east coast of the United States. One can get a real sense of travel moving across the Great Lakes through the quite fantastical way that Popo mapped the sources of the Mississippi River. Highly inaccurate and interesting. And then down the river over ancient St. Louis to the Delta and New Orleans. And then sort of rocket-like, we, we move up, twist the map around to where we began. And then, of course, that same process now, that was all desktop, can be done in Google Earth. The second example is looking here at Colton's map of New York City from 1836 in Luna application. The drips, 1852, a little later, and then the wonderful Veeley map from 1865. In Luna, we see them in their relative size, faithful to the original, zooming into the Murray Hill area, which I was investigating in Luna. There's no GIS here, but there's a real sense of the original map. Looking at them in our first foray into GIS with the quad viewer, they're now all the same scale, same size. And then going into Google Earth, see the same three maps on top of each other with modern data, tilting the Earth, see the context of the maps, and then do transparency through the 52, the 65, the 36, and the modern satellite view. And then we bring the 1836 map into Second Life, where it floats about 200 meters above the valley floor in my map island. It's laid out over about 400 meters. This is my avatar, Map Darwin, staring out across towards the Statue of Liberty, looking at the downtown, looking at a wonderful model of the Brooklyn Bridge that a Second Life user has built. And then thinking about walking uptown, but then coming back to the reservoir, which is the site of the New York Public Library today. In Second Life, we've got a whole new perception of this map now. A sense of its really enormous size, even though it's five feet physically. Uh, my avatar can fly through the map. There's no gravity in Second Life. And drop down. So this transformation of the map continues in Second Life, where we offer wonderful ways. He's dropping down here to our welcome center and the world map in front of it. Wonderful ways to experience these maps in new form. The scale is huge. We have maps stretched out over four sims and extending hundreds of meters up into the sky. The experience can be shared with others. You can add your own annotations here, as people have done on the world map, and comment. People can take away over 50 maps, viewers, and globes to their own spaces in Second Life and pass them on to others. So Second Life offers us the beginning elements of a digital library. Plus, importantly, it's a place to fly over and into the maps, walk on the maps, and get to know them in a whole new way. I've collaborated with a group called Centric, which came to me through Bernie Frischer. They're a group of Second Life developers with a strong interest in the artistic and educational uses of Second Life. They've taken a great deal of care in working with me on, in building this world. I look forward to working with them on several new projects that we will try here, bringing more maps onto the island and showing them in new ways. I'm excited that we'll be able to redefine what a map library is and can be in a virtual world. As Second Life opens up to outside databases, which we are told by Linden Labs they're going to do, I envision having access to all of my maps in Second Life from the Luna database, and using the three-dimensional world to, to display them in interesting ways, and to allow the discovery of data by actually moving to it and through it. Also, I believe Second Life will be adding GIS. And, of course, to collaborate with users to build things together, because Second Life is very much a social space.
I think that virtual worlds like Second Life can do more for the academic community than just recreate classrooms for distance learning, although that's certainly a powerful part of their many uses. Virtual worlds can also contain and display information and experiences in entirely new ways. From this example here, this highly accurate recreation of the Dresden Gallery, which is a marvelous museum in Germany. It was entirely destroyed in the Second World War, rebuilt, and now they've rebuilt the whole thing in Second Life. All the paintings on the walls, all the textures, the images are fairly high resolution. So this is a whole new way to look at these paintings compared to how you might see them in a Luna kind of application where you're looking at thumbnails, now you're seeing them all in relation to each other. And you can, in fact, stick your nose up and get fairly close to them. The resolution is pretty darn good. My own approach is obviously less literal. I've actually, it, perhaps it's because I have maps, but I've taken a more GIS approach and stretched maps out. One experiment that I have just been in the midst of doing, and it's not completed, you'll see hovering in the clouds in the upper right, are map cylinders. This is 600 meters tall. It has 2,000 thumbnails on it. You can see it here from the New York map. It's a whole other way to look at thumbnails, obviously. Each thumbnail is 1024 by 768. Here's the thumbnail approach as I will have them in Luna, and here they are in this cylinder that you can move through in second line. So the whole theme here is moving to the information physically. As I said, if we look at this image in the center, bring it up close, fairly high resolution. You can click on any of the thumbnails and it will go into the Luna database and allow you to zoom in, see it in detail, and to get the data record. And of course, it's an interesting shape. Here's a, a little example of my avatar flying towards the cylinder. I used to work with buildings, you know. I think it probably shows. But I do find this shape fascinating. My avatar can fly into it and then sort of Alice in Wonderland-like drop down through it When they open up to outside databases, all of these thumbnails will be able to be linked directly to a database. And you'll be able to uh, obviously create other kinds of shapes and so on. I think rich visualization tools like virtual reality, 3D globes, and advanced tools to use high resolution imagery like Luna will continue to validate users' desktop screens as places for detailed examination of visual evidence of all kinds, not just maps. But as I was discussing with Joel before the lecture, at the same time, I think mobile devices, which he's going to tell you very interesting things about, will become also powerful visual tools as technologies like Sea Dragon, which unfortunately Microsoft has swallowed up, but we still hope it will reemerge will come into being. These will allow small, small PDF windows to look at rich visual material uh, easily. To conclude, cartographers have long used globes as means of comprehending the world in one view. This is a pocket globe from 1731 by Richard Cushy, London. It sits in a little shark skin case with the heavens on the inside, three inches big. Here, my my example um, of the 3D globe in, in Google Earth and Google Sky is its own kind of pocket reality. I think that virtual globes, such as NASA's WorldWind, Google Earth, Microsoft's Virtual Earth, and ESRI's Arc Globe, and here seeing the globes in the virtual world of Second Life, all these virtual globes will play a very large role in our view of what mapping is and how GIS advances. They'll be part of the growth of new mapping services that will include public GIS, 3D buildings, virtual worlds, tools to create maps and to annotate maps online, and the building of Web 2.0 digital map libraries made by users. 
The special reality of working with these globes in Second Life is very compelling for me because it adds human scale so well, as we can see, looking at my avatar, exploring the globe spaces on the island. For me, one of the most interesting directions of GIS and maps, looking ahead to the next decade, is the fusion of 3D GIS, virtual globes, and virtual reality spaces like Second Life, a kind of second Earth, which Wade Rush has written about very interestingly in MIT's Technology Review. I recommend the article. Inside such a space, my avatar, Matt Darwin, is looking at the celestial globe transformed by GIS, originally inspired by Google Earth and Sky, and now made super scale in Second Life. I think the creator of this celestial globe over 200 years ago in Rome, Giovanni Cassini, would agree that digital technologies have indeed given his marvelous work truly a Second Life. And for me, as a collector of paper maps, these same technologies have created the privilege, really, of opening up my passion for maps to the world and giving a second life to my private collection as an ever-evolving public resource. Thank you very much.